Good evening. All right. Um, you ready? I am ready. I have audio whenever. Sing. You never close your eyes anymore when I kiss your lips. There's no tenderness like before in your fingertips. You try and hard not to show it, baby. But baby, baby, I know it. You lost that loving feeling. Whoa, that loving feeling. You lost that loving feeling. Now it's gone, gone, gone. Whoa, whoa, whoa. ba doop ba doop Hello. Hello and good evening. Uh, thanks for waiting. Uh, we're out here in uh, the state of Washington. I'm Nick Bonner. This is Greg Mosguy, Gavin Williams uh, from Sampson. Uh, we're really excited to be out here. We're going to do a factory tour. We're going to look through uh, the lab. We've got some drop tests. We yep. break some stuff. Uh, it's going to be pretty exciting. Um, I'd like to thank Jake Miller, Carson Royer, Kale Royer, uh, the whole technical team at Tree Stuff the whole team here at Sampson um, for being incredibly welcoming. This is our first like remote factory webinar. And uh, you know, I think if this one goes well, we'll probably do more of these. Uh, I loved the tour today. It was really cool. They, we've got some really exciting stuff. We did a pre-recorded tour uh, this afternoon where we've got some video that we'll show you. It's really loud in the factory, so we weren't gonna be able to get good audio there. Um, but we're gonna take you through and show you Arborist product all the way from fiber to how it's measured, um, how it's packaged, uh, the whole thing. Uh, Greg is the head of R&D. Yep. He's also an incredible singer. Um, <laughs> he was jazzing us all up. Um, it gets a little hectic kind of at the ends and we have, we're like, Greg, dude, you gotta shut up, man. <laughs> like, we're, you're over here singing and we're trying to get this stuff done. But uh, we opened with a nice little number there. Uh, Gavin, you are the head of business development and marketing. Um, For Arborist, yeah. For Arborist, he is basically the fun part of Samson. Um, and it was, it was Gavin's idea to bring us out here and to do this webinar. So uh, big props to, to you guys. It's been fun. Uh, Greg, do you want to tell us a little bit? You have like a spiel you want to give? Yeah, so basically we're going to, uh, like you were saying, we're going to do a quick video showing kind of how rope is made. We'll talk a little bit about what makes uh, rope in general a fairly unique tool and some of the work that goes into us designing ropes uh, specifically for industries. Um, we'll give you a sneak pre preview of the lab where we got all kinds of fun toys we get to play with. Uh, and then we're going to do some Q&A about just uh, Arborist product, some other uh, ideas we've been working on over the years to help make uh, the use of our rope tools better and easier and safer uh, for Arborist. Awesome. I, I have a question um, first, so because I'm here. Uh, when you guys uh, look at making a new rope, when you um, kind of when you're coming out with the V series, right? You have yep. a, the new Voyager. What are, like, what's the way that you approach that as a senior engineer here? Um, and like, how do you direct your team? Like, like, what do you do like when you make a new rope? How's that process I mean, work? the really the beginning of the process starts with, uh, you know, what's the design intent that we talk about? So we say, what, how is it being used, right? I mean, a rope is a rope is a rope. Uh, in the end of the day, however, we make thousands of different types of ropes, which you got to see a little bit of in the plant today. Uh, the idea is we really want to design the rope to be fit for purpose for exactly what the user is wanting to do with it. So it, it's more than just being about strength, for example, or lightweight, because in the end of the day, we can make anything really, really strong. It doesn't necessarily mean it's going to work well, uh, for example, for a climbing line. So really understanding the usage. Um, you know, we've built up a team over the years of, of engineers and technicians who really get in hands-on with our products, um, whether it's climbing up a tree, uh, you know, sailing overnight in a, in a sailboat race or, uh, you know, heading out onto a big uh, oil tanker and, and working with the crew out, out at sea, really getting to know what the guys on the ground are doing with the product, what are their challenges in dealing with their current products, and how we can make that better. And at the end of the day, we build tools. Very cool. Um, what were some of the things with the Voyager rope that you guys tried to address? Um, with the Voyager rope, we were trying to make something that just uh, handled a lot better in a, in a climbing, uh, for a climbing product. So trying to get around issues, you know, 
things like milking or hot sure. or, or when it tends you know not hockling up but you, sometimes you get that little half turn in there it kind of jams yeah. up so trying to get things that run a little better feel a little better um and wear longer so you know as we'll show you guys out in the lab we got a whole suite of tools that we're using on all scales from fiber up to small ropes up to big ropes of stretching it rubbing it twisting it burning it i mean we've got a whole host of tools and so trying to get that right balance of really improving something and making something that looks nice too you know i think at the end of the day you want to be proud of, of the tools you're using um mm -hmm. so we wanted something that that looks good and feels good okay. and is proven to work awesome gavin you have the mercury here you were telling me earlier uh, about how you worked on the color and the scheme for that. Do you yeah. want to share a little of that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, so like Greg was talking about the Voyager, uh, lots of different climbers have lots of different needs. So we make different kinds of ropes for each one of those applications. Uh, the new Mercury rope we're just coming out with is a good egg deal, a deal of, of, or a good example of how things go from concept to shelf. So for example, um, I was out in the field once and one of the climbers came to me and said, how come Samson doesn't make a curd mantle rope? And you guys know a curd mantle obviously um, is a parallel core construction of a nylon uh, nylon core with a with a uh, polyester cover. Um, and so I went back to the engineers, and we actually make a couple different curd mantle static ropes. Uh, but one thing that's really really cool about our lab back here is that every week um, they're all supposed to do a little bit of um, testing, a little bit of uh, of going outside the box and doing something different. Well, one of my designers was actually looking at this. And they were looking at the manufacturing process. They made a small tweak in how it's built. And the result was that it ended up being having a softer hand and having a higher strength, uh, a brake strength, which I thought was really amazing. So I took that along with the consumer feedback saying we didn't have a, a kern mantle rope, which we definitely do. Um, and so I thought, well, how could, what's the best way to commercialize this and get this back out into the marketplace? Um, so kind of as we were building that, that construct together, the other thing I noticed when I was out in the field is that uh, lots of the climbers, lots of the arborists we were seeing was wearing orange camo. So we actually took a rope that we had, but we tweaked and upgraded. We recolored it into some of that orange camo. Um, and we commercialized it. We launched it last year. Aside from doing a ton of field trial, uh, we launched it on TCI Expo in November. Lots of really good feedback. Lots of great reception. Um, you can buy it at Tree Stuff. So we're really excited about it's that. It's a hot color. And yeah. orange camo like is not landing on my runway. As a personal <laughs> thing, like you're never going to see me wear an orange camo. But I really dig the rope. So you know whether it came from orange camo or just a very cool pattern, I like it. It's hot. Yeah. yeah so I mean, like on social media, some of the arborists we worked with, uh, really high viz, NFPA certified, um, 8,600 pounds of uh, average break strength. Jeez, what else can you do? Um, yeah, it's good for uh, single rope technique. Uh, rescue and access. So again, we're really excited about it and, it, and we're really pleased at, about the reception that it's had. Well, I'm excited to dive into the factory tour. All right. Um, what do you say that we get ready and we roll that beautiful bean footage? Carson, yeah? All right, let's do it. Let's go into the factory. Greg is gonna narrate for us and talk us through the production process. So this is, a, this is gonna be a quick walk through of our uh, Ferndale production facility. So this is about half of our total production uh, space, about 25,000 in the Washington. Uh, all of our arborist product is gonna be, or is produced here in, in Washington. Um, so I'm just looking down the aisle, real, it's a cellular manufacturing setup, um, really working on trying to improve efficiency, improve uh, you know, worker ergonomics. As you can see, there's not a whole lot of guys on the floor, and that really speaks to the efficiency of the control. The production team has, you know, made sure we maximize the throughput and efficiency and accuracy. I'm so, following uh, you. Kevin's going to walk us down to the front. And basically, all of our ropes, or almost all of our ropes, are produced in a fundamentally similar manner. Um, yeah, so we, we start with raw fiber. Uh, this is stuff that we're going to buy in from the outside, from the vendors. You know, whether it's nylon, polyester, Dyneema, Technora. Um, and the first thing we're generally going to do is twist those fibers up. So here you see a krill rack. It's got a bunch of packages of small pieces of fiber. Um, these get drawn through based on the design of the rope. We're going to choose different numbers of ends of these fibers. I want to do little tensioners, and those are going to come together in a twisting machine. So here you can see all the, all the individual ends of fiber that are felt for by the design. And they're spreading out, and they're going into a into a ring twister bag. Uh, so the idea here is what you're doing is you're taking those individual yarns and you're twisting them up 
and that twist actually imparts uh, uh, different characteristics to the rope. It actually helps those individual fibers work together. Um, you know, if, if an individual filament breaks, if you had a completely untwisted group of fibers like a horse's tail, any individu individual filament break would take it out of the structure of the rope. By twisting it together, you're able to transfer load from one filament to the other. So you get this really damage tolerant structure, uh, which is you know, kind of characteristic of fiber ropes. It also creates a very, very flexible structure, like if you were to make something out of steel wire or bronze. We'll start our second twist process. The next step you see here is, is step number two, which is going to be rewinding. So oftentimes, in many of our constructions, what we'll see is multiple twisting strands running together. Um, so we'll often rewind it or twist it a second time. So this is like a second twist operation. So he's taking in and, and running through a, a twister here. You can't actually see the, the fibers whipping around so fast, but it's essentially going around this central package like a jumper. Uh, what we call a, a fiber and that's bubble. what creates these uh, bobbing. You really want to see it up close. Here's a bunch of some twisted cores okay. getting ready to go in the center of a terminal rope. So each one of these guys, yep, that's a that's a that's a center for the turn mantle. Again, all the different colors for all the different covers, uh, cover designs. There you can see a waxing operation on the left, so we pre-wax the yarns. No twisters, no twisters, no twisters. <laughs> all right, I think I think Kevin's about to jump to a breaker here. So um, yeah, after, after we've got the, the strands twisted up, we'll wind those guys onto a, a braider bobbin, and those go onto a braider machine. And, and the braider machine essentially runs these uh, carriers uh, in opposite directions around a central hub. And they're going to switch in and out from each other. So in this case, you can see the, the, the white ones are moving. Is there a way to run it slow? You still have plenty of reserve strength for the rest of the road. Not on this one. Okay. Yes, yes, this is blue strength. Well, I can come with the target. Yep. All right. There you go, jogging machine. So, yeah, this is a. You know, and it, that's basically representative of the process. It, it, usually, it, the, the biggest differences end up being coming down to a matter of scale. You know, we have, uh, we have braiders that make, you know, stuff that's two millimeters in diameter. We have braiders that can make rope that's 200 millimeters in diameter. So, kind of really uh, saw some of that spans the gamut. With the bobbins that were almost as tall as us. Yeah, yeah. I mean, in some of the other industries we're in, uh, you know, particularly around large-scale construction and mining and uh, offshore oil development, I mean, we've got, we've got ropes that we've tested, brake tested, you know, three million pounds plus for a single piece of rope. So... Uh, our kind of our broad uh, range of products and applications really lets us, you know, uh, cross pollinate between the different industries, which is a lot of fun. Um, back to our tour here, we're looking at a whole uh, whole series of raiders all working in in in, uh, in parallel here, running different products through the floor. How many feet of rope do you think you guys produce in a day here? Oh, geez, I have no idea. <laughs> you're on a big number then, just I, I would probably go by pounds. Thirty thousand. No, I mean we're we're running you know thousands of tons of material a year, right? I'm pretty sure. I, I don't know. We got to talk to the production guys. I mean, I, I do the design stuff. <laughs> but yeah, we, I mean, we run it. The answer is 10 million. Uh, yeah, a lot. <laughs> yeah. And then, like, like I said, this is about half of our total production capacity. The other half of our production capacity is down in Lafayette, Louisiana. Um, so, a little bit different. get it laid out in a straight line, otherwise it's really hard to measure. So this is a, a, a reeling and measuring device that puts the rope under a, a certain amount of reference tension and runs it through a reeling device to very, very accurately measure it and immediately runs into a poly bag. So this again is an example of kind of lean manufacturing technologies or lean manufacturing ideas that we've incorporated. So it comes right off the braider, gets accurately measured to within about an inch. The operator can then cut it off, heat seal the end, drops it into a bag, the bag goes in a box, and it's ready to ship. How come when I measure the rope with a yardstick, it always measures short? 
like I said, you got, you got to be able to put it under that, that little bit of reference tension. And, and how we define reference tension, or how the Cordage Institute, in fact, defines reference tension is you take the diameter of the rope. Uh, so if it's a half-inch rope, you say 200 times that diameter squared. So in the case of a half-inch rope, one-half squared is one-quarter times 200, so would be 50 pounds. So if you wanted to measure really accurately a half-inch rope, what you do is you put it under 50 pounds of tension, and then you measure it. And that basically gives you consistency. Because unless you do that, you're going to always, you know, how straight is it? Well, it's not quite straight. Um, this is a larger braider here now. So this is a, a big cover braider. It looks like we're braiding a, a, a big double braid. Looking at it, yeah, that's a super strong. So that's a big all nylon double braid. Um, we sell a little bit of super strong into arborist. It also goes into a whole lot of other industries. So it goes into fishing. It goes into, you know, big commercial mooring and tug applications, kind of all over the board. Judging by that one, that one's probably going into a, to a big commercial marine application. That's probably, what, inch and a half there. How many other manufacturers uh, have the range that Samson does? You know, uh, I don't think there's any other U.S. manufacturer has the range. You know, there, might, there might be one manufacturer I can think of in Europe that, that has the range, but I'm not even sure if they do. I mean, most guys tend to really focus in on, hey, we just do the small stuff, or we do the specialty stuff, or we do the big offshore stuff. You know, one of the things that's kept us really uh, – uh, healthy over the years in, in economic slowdowns and speed ups is we really do have a balance of, of products in the portfolio. Um, and I think that's also great for our design. It really lets people see all those different industries, get ideas. I mean, we cross pollinate a lot. You know, I, sure. I'm, a, I'm a sailor for a hobby. I like to go out and sail. But you know, the ideas I get while sailing and being able to test out ropes on my boat, you know, oftentimes will feed into something completely different, like say, hey, a different kind of rigging line or you know, a better way to do a, a winch line for a, for a large vehicle. Um, with these larger scale machines, it's really, it's a lot easier to see oh, yeah. uh, how the bobbins are actually handed off. Mm -hmm. I think with the smaller scale machines, you don't actually notice that the bobbin is like being passed through that notch in yep. the bottom of the plate. Yep. And in a couple of these shots that we've just shown, um, you're able to see that really clearly. Yep. And it, it you know, because it kind of looks like the three bobbins just spin together. Yep, on you're that right. Same yeah. Thing. Yeah. If you were to follow one bobbin around, depending which direction, it's actually we... traveling yeah. in it, a circle. Yeah. It goes in a circle, kind of figure eighting. looks like that rope is getting ready to go into coating. So a lot of our ropes will coat, uh, you know, at twisting, and some of them will also coat afterwards. So here they're queuing up some ropes uh, to pull out of a basket, and it's going to run into a coating tank here. Uh, is this not the coating operation? Oh, this is more reeling and counting. I'm sorry. I looked in the wrong thing. Okay, yeah. So they're, again, they're, they're reeling off under load, uh, measuring off a precise amount, and dropping it into a box, uh, getting it ready for shipment. The setup for coating looks similar too, so sorry about the confusion. <laughs> we're getting to we're getting to oh, we're getting there. All right. The fun, the fun part of doing live video. <laughs> All right, now we're queued up for coating. Okay, you can see in the background there uh, a little tank of yellow. So yeah, here similarly, like, as I was saying, we will take a uh, an already braided rope in this case, and we're going to want to apply a coating to the outer surface of it. You know, that coating has a number of functions. It's gonna, it can change the coefficient of friction. It'll improve the wear, cap uh, the wear capabilities. It adds color for identification. It improves UV stability. So you got a, kind of a lot of functions here. Uh, and it looks like it's coming out of the coating bath, getting ready to go into a dryer. So we flake them into these big baskets, uh, and then it goes into a huge furnace to dry it out. Uh, all the leftover coating there. Where's Kevin going next? The ovens, there's an oven. Opens like a garage door and we stack, you know, tons of baskets in there. There you go. Yep, so forklift them in there. That, that oven looks like it's pretty empty right now. Um, depending on what we're doing, sometimes that thing's stacked up uh, 25 feet high. Yep, so big, big furnace. Good thing about doing it this way is you're able to have all the, uh, all, all the, uh, the, the fumes that you're drying off all vent outside so you know, we, we, employees aren't having to wear respirators or anything silly like that, so keep, keeping everyone safe. And it's all uh, water-based coating, so nothing, nothing nasty. There's a rack of dye. 
a lot of ropes where we're really critical about uh, how the uh, firmness is on the jacket, for example. During braiding, we'll run it through a die like that to help control the diameter. There's Keith mixing up a batch of coating, so he's taking a batch of resin of one type and is going to mix it uh, with pigments and sometimes a second type of uh, resin. Um, we've developed a handful of various uh, custom coating formulations in-house. So again, we're looking for the, the coating that's fit for purpose. Depends on what we're doing. Yeah, so that looks like he's, he's pouring the resin right there, weighing it out carefully. Once he's got it all put together, he's going to compound it with a mixer and send it off, dispatch it to whichever cell is calling for it. So uh, yeah, Keith uh, uh, works primarily in that coating area, so that's, that's his thing. He's got all those recipes dialed and will be in dispatches to the floor, whatever they need for, for that particular production job. This is an inline dryer right here, uh, another piece of hardware that we've developed in-house and built. So this is, again, for certain types of products, it's advantageous to dry it uh, under tension. So basically the rope runs through this oven uh, held under tension and uh, you know, has a long dwell time in there. It goes over a bunch of pulleys. And so it goes in, goes in soaking wet with coating and comes out perfectly dry, ready to reel up and ship. Um, diff different processes for different products, but at the end of the day, we're trying to create the, the right process for each product to both optimize the performance of the product as well as make the production process as efficient as possible. And that's really what's allowed us to keep you know, all of our production here in the United States. I love that, by the way, that 100% of the Samson production is here in the US. Yep. Yep, and I mean, you know, it's it's a it's a competitive labor market in the world, you know, and it's like, and we're saying, you know, we got we got to do it smarter, we got to do it better, because if it just comes down to, hey, how cheap can I produce it for, you know, we're not going to win building here. We're going to only win building here by making better stuff, making it smarter, uh, and and keeping our employees happy and safe. Tell, tell us about these splicing tables. This is some pretty impressive stuff going on. Okay, yeah, so we do quite a bit of fabrication here as well. I mean, a lot of times our fabrication is done by fabricating partners and distributors, but for other industries, we'll do a lot of our splicing uh, and hardware installation here. So we actually have a team of, of splicers who work here and will do all kinds of uh, splicing, uh, whether it's putting eyes and arborist ropes, whether it's putting together mooring sets for, for you know, like a large natural gas tanker. Um, we even do a little bit of heavy lift slings you know, so building lifting slings for, for assembling a uh, large piece of equipment, you're talking millions of pounds in some cases, uh, capacity. And that's all done here. The splice bench you see is all marked out uh, so they can measure lengths real well. We've got a bunch of winches on either end and all those winches are all hooked up with load cells. You can see the winch line come up through the table there. That winch line actually has a load cell on it, again, uh, to help make the splice uh, correct as well as to keep the operator safe. You don't want to have somebody accidentally overload a line while they're doing it and either damage the line or hurt themselves. So again, uh, safety involved here. Here's a large diameter am still blue. Looks like it's being spliced together. Probably a mooring set, glancing at the size of that thing. So you're looking at about, I don't know, inch and a half, inch and three quarters. Uh, you know, a couple hundred pound, couple hundred thousand pound brake strength right there. That's probably going to a large vessel. And uh, you know, we're just about done with the video here. So we're gonna cut back to our, our chit chat. All right, that was, uh, that was awesome. I loved it. Um, I think that the machinery uh, and like the complexity of the engineering that goes into these products that we rely on and use uh, up in the canopy is, it's really impressive, you know. Um, just, it's just, just the sheer complexity of it. The stuff is amazing, like the size and the amount of the tools. Um, some of those machines, and I mean, I say this in a good way, look like they might be 100 years old, like they've been built and maintained. Yeah. And they have. We've got a mix of stuff. I mean, we just recently retired a machine we had in Lafayette, but I think it was about 95 years old. That's yep. so and, cool. And we just retired that. And we got stuff that's brand new. I mean, every year we're bringing in new equipment. Yeah. We're repairing the old stuff. We're upgrading it. But yeah, there's a lot of legacy stuff, and we try to we try to stay efficient. And as long as it works well, there's a, we definitely keep it, keep like it running. a mix between these like giant iron machines yeah. and these like newer. They look like uh, like. Um, like cab lathes yeah. with, you know, full cabinets and like yeah. everything's all very futuristic. Well, we've been around for 140 years, so we've been making rope for a while. So. That's really <laughs> cool. Uh, we've got Jonathan Downs. John's here. Uh, John is a senior lab technician uh, and basically is like the man to see uh, in the lab. Jonathan, tell us a little bit about what you do um, and your position here. And then I think we're going to cut to the video that you uh, pre-recorded with us a little earlier in the day. All right. 
So I've been working here for seven years. I started over in manufacturing, and then after about a year and a half, I moved into the lab. Um, it's pretty cool being able to test all these ropes and test all the applications, but what really makes the lab special is the actual communication that we get with R&D and engineering. When uh, we have those tests going on downstairs, we're pretty much constantly having our engineers coming down, watching the tests, and actually getting ideas and kind of getting inspired by what they're seeing when, when we're doing the tests. So instead of an engineer having to travel to a different test facility and do that same thing, we actually have it here and it's happening every day. So we get some really amazing innovation when you're sitting there watching a test and you're thinking, wow, why is this abrading the way that it is? Or why is it wanting to twist in that direction or not? And we get that with customers too. I mean, we bring customers yeah. in the lab all the time too, just like you guys. I mean, from across our industries, you know, we'll get, you know, tug captains coming in here, you know, with the rope that they've been using for the last, you know, two years on their tugboat. And we'll say, hey, let's break this together, figure out how much strength is left in it. Let's figure out how you can improve your operations uh, to maximize the lifetime and service of your rope. So really kind of working together with customers, um, with the team here, you know. Yep. It's really fun. Design the best it, stuff we can. It's amazing. There's and a having ton of those, cool machines in there too. Having those test experts that actually know all the standards and can do all the tests, it really helps when you're actually communicating with the, with the customers. Well, I'm excited to see it again um, and to show everyone. So uh, let's roll the footage uh, that we recorded earlier. And then afterwards, uh, we're going to bring this panel and Gavin back. And we're going to do a Q&A. So if you've got questions for us, send them in the chat. Carson and Jake are making a list. Um, and then we'll take those questions and we'll answer them live. And uh, we can you know, let that discussion be kind of free flowing from there. So uh, let's roll the footage. Hey, my name's Jonathan Downs. I'm a senior lab technician here at Samson, and I'm going to give you guys a tour of the lab. So let's start it off. Over here is all of our yarn tests, and I'm going to bring, through, bring it through essentially like the whole process of testing uh, more climbing lines, and we'll go through fiber all the way to actual rope testing. So we're going to start with fiber testing, and I'll show you a couple of the machines. This is our Admet tinsel tester machine. This is just fiber tinsel testing, and then we'll do some tension fatigue testing as well, and then some small rope testing. Right now we have Dyneema fiber clamps on there, so this is a high modulus fiber test. We'll rope the line through, we'll close up the clamps, and then we'll actually pull it to break, and we'll measure the actual uh, uh, peak load that the uh, line sees. Nothing too fancy with this test. It's got a nice screwball that loads it up to break. And then we'll actually record peak load. We can actually, we can record uh, strain as well on this line, or on this machine. Can you show us one? An actual test? Yeah, definitely. Let me get a piece of fiber. Bring the line over here. Put the line through. Close up. Oh. Let's see if. Close up one clamp. Close up the second. Cut the piece of fiber. And you can see the pneumatic clamps actually clamp the fiber together. Then we'll come over here. Zero it. We'll load it up to failure. And that's a fiber break. Nothing too fancy. That one broke at 67 pounds. We'll record the data, and then we'll do another one. We typically do about five, uh, 10 to 20 fiber breaks when we're actually looking at a fiber strength. And they typically vary about five to 10% standard deviation, or a CV, the normalized standard deviation. We test batches that come in, 
And then we also do a lot of new fiber testing. So we'll be doing a lot of analysis on new fibers that come into the, come into the facility. And that's typically the main part of the fiber testing that we do, is we're always looking for new fibers, cheaper fibers, stronger fibers. Over here we have our creep tester and our yarn on yarn tester. This one we got a couple cap stands that will run the fiber through, bring it down through a heat chamber, and then attach a dead weight to it. And what this is doing is it's putting the, the fiber under a constant tension or a constant load. And there's essentially three types of permanent elongation that happens. There's the stage one, which is a pretty fast, quick elongation where the fibers are essentially aligning. And then it will go into this phase two permanent elongation, which is all the fibers are aligned. Um, they're pretty much evenly holding that load. And this is the one that lasts a long time. This is what's typically happening when you're actually using the fibers or working with the ropes. And then at the end, there will be a phase three permanent elongation. And that's where the actual fibers will start to break and degrade and, and strength. And we're measuring how long it takes for this particular fiber to get to that phase three. Um, these, these permanent elongations are typically called creep. And that's what we're actually testing with this. So this is our creep machine. And over here is the, uh, the uh, heat box. So we can set it up to a certain temperature and degrees Celsius. And then see, see how long it takes for it to creep to failure. Over here is our last fiber testing machine. It's our yarn on yarn tester. And what this is doing is we tie the fiber here, we wrap it around this pulley, bring it up through here and hang a dead weight from it. And then we put twists on the fiber itself so that when this is running, the fiber's sliding on itself and causing it to abrade. So there's kind of two types of rope abrasion. There's the internal abrasion and the external abrasion. This is a measurement of how well that fiber can handle that internal abrasion. So with internal abrasion, it's essentially just fibers rubbing and sliding against each other that's causing the rope to degrade. That friction from it sliding against each other will actually slowly the, degrade the rope to failure. This is essentially a fiber analysis tool. So whenever we're getting new fibers in, we'll use this to determine how, how well its internal abrasion uh, characteristics are or it's yarn on yarn abrasion characteristics. We're currently measuring the number of cycles and this has a couple varying loads on it at the moment. But this is all the same fiber? Yeah, this is all the same fiber. Over here we have our rope abrasion tester and this is essentially an external abrasion tester. So we'll run a rope through here. I'm gonna grab a rope real fast so I can demonstrate it. Tie a line off on this side. Run it through the bottom of this apparatus. And then tie it off to this hydraulic cylinder. Once it's tied off, we'll load it up using the hydraulic cylinder, and then this wheel will actually spin and slowly rub on the rope. And it'll rub under that specific load until it actually fails. And that's how we measure how long it'll take for, for a specific rope to actually uh, fail due to abrasion. And what we'll use this for specifically is to actually compare one rope type to another. Over here, we'll load up, 
then the wheel will actually rotate against it. And that, what that's doing is it's just cycling around that bar and slowly wearing the rope against a pretty standard surface. Nice smooth surface. We also have a couple different fixtures. I'm gonna stop that. We can change the surface that it's actually running on, but typically that just makes this test a bit more aggressive depending on the surfaces. There isn't much of a difference between one surface to another other than just how aggressive or how quickly it runs through that uh, test. Now I'm gonna move on to the tinsel testers. These are our rope tinsel testers. This one's the Tinius Olsen. And over in the corner, we have the Satec, our big 1.1 million pound tinsel tester. These are both controlled by hydraulic rams and it uses an Instron program called the Partner Program to actually run the test. Uh, we typically run at constant load rates and we'll do a cycling of 10 cycles and then we'll load, to, load the rope to break. Um, almost always, when we're testing the rope, we're using splices. You can see right here, here's a splice line that just went through some actual abrasion. And now we're actually gonna load that up and load it to failure. But they have the splices on them. Typically, every time that we test a rope, we do it to, or do it with splices. Uh, knots typically reduce the strength of the line from about 50 to 70% of the actual brake strength. Uh, with a splice, you're getting 95 to 100% of the actual rope strength, depending on what the splice is and how well you splice it. There's one other way that we can actually test the rope without using knots, and that's a, a capstan brake test. Well, we'll run it around a fixed pin, and then we'll tie it off onto a cleat, and we'll load it up to brake. And every time it goes around that capstan, uh, the amount of friction that's involved with it will actually reduce the, uh, the load on the stagnant end, or the fixed end. Over here we have our Satec tinsel tester. This is our 1.1 million pound tinsel tester. It's got a fixed cross head on this side that we can adjust uh, the pin sizes to test different types of rope or different sizes of eyes. And then on the other side of the machine, we have our actual hydraulic ram. What makes this machine unique isn't the load that it can go to. There's many uh, tinsel testers throughout the US and throughout the world that can go to much higher loads than this one can. It's the actual amount of stroke that it has. Uh, typically when you're, when you're uh, testing a rope, it has about five to 35% elongation, depending on what type of rope you have. And with that said, you need all that stroke to be able to actually pull it to failure. So this one has 16 feet of stroke, so it can use pretty much for nylon ropes, we can break up to about a 40 foot length. And for high modulus ropes, we can go up to 60, 70 feet and still be able to actually pull the line to failure. We got a couple linear extensometers and that's actually measuring the rope or the elongation in the clear rope. So we'll hook these to the clear rope of the rope or the clear rope of the line. And then we'll do the cycling and it will measure the elongation specifically in the clear rope. Uh, elongation essentially changes throughout the different areas of the line. The splice area and the eyes have slightly different elongation than the actual clear rope. And that's why we measure just clear the rope? clear rope. Clear rope is anywhere in between the termination points. Now we're gonna go and do the uh, drop test. So over here is our drop test tower. We do all of our drop tests to the EN 1891 standard. Um, it's a European standard that almost every climbing line, if you wanna sell in the Europe, 
European countries will have to actually go to this standard. Um, we have a 200 pound weight that we're actually gonna drop from our Arborist climbing line. We got a 16 strand Blue Streak Arborist climbing line up there. So I'm gonna attach the line and then we're gonna go through a dynamic drop where it drops about two meters and we're essentially measuring to see if the rope can actually withstand that, that length of a drop. Uh, typically when you're doing these drop tests, the line sees about The line sees about 4,000 uh, pounds of load, which is about 80% of this line's brake strength. And we'll do this drop five times. We'll do this drop five times so that we can determine if it'll actually continuously be able to la last a couple falls. So I'm gonna load this up. We're also gonna need to have our helmets on for this test. I'm going to give you guys a helmet as well. And this might get a little bit noisy. The winch that we have is, is pretty loud. But I'm going to raise this weight up, attach it to our line, sit the length down, and then I'll actually do the drop. So I'm going to attach the arborist line to this weight carabiner. But I noticed you're using a knot here, not a splice. Yeah, we all the uh, EN standards will use the figure of eight knot for most of its testing. Um, typically in the European countries, they do not use any splices for their arborist climbing lines. Gonna sit the distance, and then we're actually gonna pull it. Drop test! That's a standard drop test for you. How much does the weight weigh? Uh, we saw a load of about 3,000 pounds, but the actual weight itself is a 200 pound weight. You'll see a little bit of abrasion in the knot area, but the actual clear rope of the line is perfectly fine, if not just a little bit better. As you tension a rope, or as you work a rope, what happens is it turns from this slightly disbalanced line to actual a unified uh, balance. So during the braiding process, during the twisting process, and any other process that affects the rope, you get a little bit of this disbalance in the fiber. And as you work it and stretch it and tension it, all that disbalance will slowly work itself out to this point where you get a pretty well-balanced line. So all of the fibers are, are evenly Yeah, so they're the essentially weight evenly aligning and all of those fibers are getting a similar strain at that point. Once you get to that point, it's, it's essentially the strongest your line will ever get until it gets past that creep point where it's actually starts degrading the line from how much the, the fibers stretched. Can we try the same drop with 600 pounds? We don't actually have a 600 pound weight. What's the biggest weight you have? Uh, we, could, we could probably try it with the 400 pound, but that drop will break the line. Yeah, we can try it real fast.
So we're going to do the same drop test, but we're going to use a 400 pound weight now. There's four different factors that really affect uh, how much load the line sees. Those factors are the actual mass that you're dropping, the distance that you're dropping it, uh, the, the length of the line itself, and then the actual line and the fiber type. Uh, most of our arborist lines use nylon and polyester, which are pretty high elongating fibers. If you were to do a drop like this with a high modulus line that's really high strength, but uh, low elongation, you're going to see five to possibly 10 times, 10 times the actual load that you're seeing on this. And what happens is that load actually gets translated. If you were to actually fall, that load gets translated into your body itself. So what we're going to do is we're going to drop this line and see if this rope can hold that 400 pounds. And we'll actually see the peak load that the line sees as well, hopefully. Drop test! And this one will most likely break. This one will break. So that rope saw a load of 5,100 pounds before it actually broke. And if it were to hold that line, it would probably see upwards to seven, 8,000 pounds based on the actual distance that it dropped. If you take a look at it, you can see that the line broke right at the knot. That's because when you make a knot, you actually have some very high pressure points and you have really tight bends in the knot area and that's what actually reduces the strength of the line at the knot. The figure of eight knots actually pretty good compared to a lot of other ones. Like a bowling knot will give you 60 to 70 percent of the actual break strength of the line. This one gave, I think that's close to 80 percent, 85 percent of the minimum break strength. That's our drop test. I loved the, the testing lab. I thought it was so cool. Um, I loved how John just knew that he's like, well, that's going to break it. I'm like, it won't break it. Just try it. He's like, it's going to break it. Um, I think that really speaks to your expertise. You knew right away uh, that that was going to work. So um, pretty cool. Uh, I know Greg wanted to talk about some uh, just kind of rope basics, some of the differences between the constructions um, and how they're manufactured. Yep. And then uh, I think after that, uh, we're going to do the Q&A. Carson's got a list of questions. If you've got questions about what was in the video um, or anything that you want to ask this panel of experts, um, whether it's about marketing and sales, testing, uh, research and design, um, or something that you could think to ask me, uh, we're here to answer it. So put those questions into the chat. Uh, we're making a list and we'll get it. Uh, in the meantime, uh, Greg, why don't you walk us through some of just kind of the differences between those basic rope constructions? So basically, uh, you know, as you guys saw out in the plant tour and a little bit in the lab, you know, we make a whole wide variety of, of rope designs, probably several thousand different rope designs that we sell, manufacture and sell. And it really comes down to a couple things in terms of being able to make the, the rope perform as you want it to. You're starting first with raw materials. Um, so you got a host of raw materials. We make ropes out of nylon and polyester and polyolefin. Those are the kinds of ropes we're going to be, you know, using as it's kind of a general what people think of as a standard rope. Then we also go into a lot of the more high performance materials. So things like Dyneema, Technora, Vectran. Can you tell me about the differences between some of those materials? Like what's the difference between polyester and polyolefin? Okay, absolutely. So Okay. Okay, so difference with differences between the fibers. So when you're what we what we call our class one fibers, so our kind of old fashioned fibers, you're gonna have nylon. Uh, nylon is gonna be the, the the fiber that's the stretchiest. So it's gonna be the most like say a rubber band, not nearly as stretchy as a rubber band. That's gonna be the rope that's gonna give you give. Um, so climbing lines where you want to have fall protection, where you don't want the the line to to put too much uh, instantaneous uh, force into your body, 
you want to go with nylon. Similarly, with a, if you're doing dynamic drops, so if you're dropping a, the, the top off a tree, you're topping it, and it's going to be a big shock load like you saw in that uh, drop test tower that Jonathan was demoing, uh, there you're going to want nylon. Polyester is kind of your best all-around uh, class one fiber. It's not going to, it's going to be a little bit stronger, not stretch as much as the nylon. It's also going to hold up the best to abrasion, to wear, and to the elements. So if you're looking for a, you know, a general rigging line or a pulling line, you know, polyester is the way to go. Olefins, uh, like uh, polyethylene and polypropylene, uh, those are really going to be uh, specialists when you're looking for lightweight. Um, so those, those materials are going to be lighter than water, so they're going to float. So you're a water skier, you want your, your ski rope to be floating, that's a polyolefin rope. Um, as we switch into the high performance stuff, that's a whole different category animal. So the Dynemas, the Technoras, the Tuarons, the Vectrans, you're looking at ropes that are going to be three to five times stronger size for size. And what are some of the differences like, you know, what, like Technora versus Vectran versus Dyneema? Okay, so a Dyneema is essentially a, is a special kind of polyethylene. So I mentioned the polyethylene, which is an olefin. The Dyneema is like a very, very special polyethylene. It's highly, highly crystallized. So the molecular structure is a very long chain molecule and it's highly oriented. Um, in terms of strength per weight, uh, you're not going to beat Dyneema. It's going to be the strongest, lightest weight rope you're going to be able to find. Um, and just for reference, you guys only use the good Dutch Dyneema here. Uh, well, the Dyneema we use is produced either in, in the Netherlands or in the United States. But not the Chinese Dyneema. No, no. Because there's two major manufacturers. Well, there's no, there's, no, there's no Chinese Dyneema. There's Chinese HMPEs. There's other, other countries, other brands produce HMPEs. The Dyneema is a brand name like Kleenex or like Samson Rope. And they produce all their fibers uh, in Holland or the United States. They got a, they do some stuff in Japan as well, cross licensed with a Japanese manufacturer. But that's that's beside the point. But you guys use the good stuff. Yes, because I know that there is, is with the Dyneema Spectro, whatever. Yeah. That there's good, and then there's like a kind of a tier two. Yeah. So no, we're 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 using the branded Dyneema grades as listed. Tier one. Yeah, tier one as listed on the website. So we're, they make a whole bunch of different grades, and they're different grades for different purposes. So you've got your SK99s, your SK78s, your SK75s, 62s, DM20s. They have a whole host of flavors, too, which we can go into details of. That's okay. We're putting the right one in the right job. So tell me, okay, so tell me how is Vectrin and how are Vectrin and Technora different than Dyneema? Okay, so Vectrin and Technora are going to be uh, about as strong as Dyneema in terms of size for size. They're a slightly more dense material. So they're going to lead to a slightly heavier rope. The big advantage is those fibers have over, say, a Dyneema or another HMP like Spectra is that those are going to be much more heat resistant. So uh, Dyneema or Spectra being a uh, uh, HMPE polyethylene, it's going to melt, uh, you know, 130C. Uh, something like a Technora is in fact a plastic as well, but it's such a interesting plastic, so to speak, that it doesn't actually melt. You cannot melt it in atmosphere. You can heat it up to the point where it will actually start to char. And that's where it singes. Yeah, yeah, but it won't melt. The only way you could actually melt it is if you heated it up in an inner atmosphere where there's no oxygen. So its uh, melting temperature is higher than its burning temperature. So maybe you can shed some light on this, but people often ask me, what kind of rope is this? And I'm like, I have no idea. And I'm like... But there's a couple ways to test it, and I, the lighter test has always been a good one for me. And in my experience, polyester and nylon, uh, polyamides, all that stuff will burn. It'll yeah. actually smoke uh, and melt and catch flame. Yeah. Uh, spectra, Dyneema, that kind of stuff will singe yeah. and melt away a little. Yeah. Um, whereas the Vectrin and the Technoras will only wither. Yeah, they kind of char. Yeah, and char. But not, they won't, like, actually, there's no melting. There's no catching flame. Yeah. The flame won't transfer from the lighter to the thing. Yeah. Are there any other, like, cool ways like that, like, with a, or any other, like, things you can use to identify a material that you don't know? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. There's, there's kind of, I mean, we, we've got a whole host of tests that we'll do in the lab. If somebody sends us something and says, what is this? John can get in there. We can do analysis on it. Uh, my favorite thing to do, if, if I see a piece of rope um, and... I, I want to know if it's, if it's an HMP. I mean, a lot of what we do is HMP, Dyneema stuff. If you take a cut end of it, like the cross section of it, and you just hold it up to your cheek, if it feels cold to your face, then it's an HMP. And wh why is that? Um, because I said that uh, the molecules are highly oriented, so very, very crystallized. So it actually has a much higher thermal conductivity in the direction of the fiber 
than in the crosswise direction, just like it's got a lot higher strength in the direction of the fiber. And so when you feel something, you feel the temperature of something, you're not actually, your body doesn't actually measure the temperature of the thing. Your body's actually measuring how well the heat is being sucked out of your body. So if I have a piece of wood in the room and a piece of steel in the room, they're both at room temperature. But if I touch the steel, it feels cold, right? And if I touch the wood, it feels warm. All right, so if you post, if you post a picture in the next couple of days, hashtag it Samson Rope Test, uh, whoever has the funniest picture uh, or the funniest interpretation of the face test, um, <laughs> we'll send a free hank of any Samson Rope that we carry at Tree Stuff uh, of your selection with or without a splice. But uh, tag Tree Stuff, tag Samson Face Test or Samson Rope Test, something funny like that. Um, and we'll we'll do something. I, I imagine somebody will have a good interpretation yeah. of the, the face test. It doesn't have to involve your face, but please keep it. Yeah, if, face. if you if you have it come across like this, it doesn't work because it's not in the crosswise direction. This this high thermal conductivity is in the fiber direction. So you really need to cut a clean. Do you recommend using the tongue? You could try. <laughs> is the tongue more sensitive uh, than the cheek? I, I go with the cheek myself. The I, mean, cheek? You, I mean, you know, you could try the tongue. <laughs> Maybe the back of the hand. Back of the, the hand. Under, back of the hand works well. Yeah. The you, armpit is nice. <laughs> is sensitive, right? Maybe it's the Samson armpit test. Uh, anyways, uh, I like this. Let's see. Share your experiences. Cut a piece of rope. See if you can detect the coldness from the highly crystallized structure of the uh, high molecular weight polyethylene materials. Very cool. So that was, we, we did a little bit of the material. I think we covered Vectrin, we covered the Technora, polyester, all that stuff. Yep. Um, tell me a little bit about some of the differences in uh, construction. 12 strand, 24 strand, 16 strand, um, Kern mantle, Absolutely. some of that stuff. Okay, so, you know, um, if you look at the history of rope, I mean, rope's been around for a long, long time. Uh, about as far back as we can go in the archeological record, people have found rope, um, you know, go to an Egyptian, pyramid tomb and you find three strand rope that looks almost identical to the three strand we produce today slightly different materials so I mean, rope, ropes older than the wheel newer than the sharp stick it's been around the tree, for a while. the tree guys that are using three strand rope look just like those people in the tombs <laughs> too um, the biggest changes over the, over the over the history though is in, in, in industrial industrialization was the tools and the machinery to produce the rope so that's where braiding came in braiding came in in the 1800s uh, with the Industrial Revolution, we started to make more complex machines so you can make these much more complicated, finer designs. And a lot of the development of rope structures has been intimately linked to the development of the tools that make them. Um, in terms of functionally how you're going to use those ropes, um, single braids are going to be, you know, your best. Like a 12-strand. Like a 12-strand rope. Like true blue. Yeah, it's going to be the, the simplest ropes to use. You're, 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 it's easy to splice. It's easy to inspect so you can physically see the core, which is the load-bearing member. Um, easy to do a splice on it. They're kind of a great all-around rope. You know, in, in across the host of our industries, I say when in doubt, you start with a single braid. Um, when you start looking at things like double braids and jacket ropes, those are going to bring a lot of advantages for specific things. So talking about climbing, all of a sudden now you want a structure that holds a nice, firm, round shape. You don't want it flattening out. So by putting a jacket on the rope, that jacket is actually there not to carry the load. That's what the core does. The core is what carries the load. The jacket there is, is there to kind of hold the whole structure together, to consolidate the structure and to protect it. And that's where we got like kind of the first kern mantle rope, where you have the kern, which is the weight-bearing part, yep. surrounded by the mantle, uh, which was non-weight-bearing. Correct. But then you get into a double braid rope. The, the core is a kern, right? Yeah. And the braid is a mantle. Yep. But they're both weight-bearing. But they're both weight-bearing. Is it a kern mantle rope? We call it a double braid. But it, so it's not a kern mantle. Because that's how I feel. I feel yeah. like a kern mantle rope has to have a parallel core, and it has to be core dependent. I think you're right. I think that's, that's the industry standard for how people describe it. And that's the funny thing about rope. You know, it's really old, and it's really universal to a lot of cultures and a lot of industries. I mean, we, we hear across of all our industries, we will oftentimes have, you know, somebody in the fishing industry refer to something that somebody in the mining industry calls something completely different, and it's the same thing. Right. You know, or heck, we even have, you know, our, between our plant here in, in Washington State and our plant in Lafayette, Louisiana, we have things that we call differently, and it's the same thing. So it's, it, there's a lot of, you know, the matter of semantics, I guess. So from an engineering standpoint, why is a 12-strand hollow braid more suited to be a sling material than a three-strand rope or than a solid braid? Why don't we use True Blue to hang our porter wraps? Absolutely. So, uh, so a 12-strand rope is, is kind of gives you that really good balance of, 
of strength and usability. So if you want it for something like you want a sling, you, you, what you're really focusing on there is you want something that's going to be strong and it's not stretchy. So for, for example, you say, why not use a three strand? The biggest challenge you're going to run with a three strand is the three strand is going to stretch a lot more given the same type of fiber. So there's really two things that are going to control your stretch. It's the raw material. So if you're using a nylon, that's stretchy versus, say, a, a Dyneema, which is not stretchy. But then also the structure. So the more you twist it, the tighter you braid it, you're giving up strength and you're making something that's going to be stretchier. Um, but you're offsetting that with how it handles. So in some cases, you don't want a really loose rope. You want a rope that's tighter and firmer. So it's really about designing the rope that's correct for the very particulars of the application. That's why all we make is rope, but we make several thousand different versions of rope. And it feels like as we've added strand count, we're constantly moving towards better handling performance. Yep. And we're doing it at the, in most cases, there's obviously exceptions, but almost always at the um, expense of durability and strength, right? We go from 16 to 24, we lose a little durability, but we gain uh, the, that handling. Right? Yeah, I, I think that's a fair assessment to make. Again, it, it also depends on how you define durability. I would say that even if you have a finer, finer count, therefore a thinner jacket, your jacket might not last as long. Um, so, you know, yes, it may, your durability may be down. But remember, the jacket is really there to protect the line. At the end of the day, what you don't want is the core to break. Right. So if your jacket was to rupture, okay, it's time to replace the line. But... That's a hell of a lot better than a line breaking. Right. So I think you have to kind of weigh uh, the usable life versus the, 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 the safe life of, of the product, awesome. if you know what I'm saying. Yeah, no, I do. Um, I think that, that's probably a pretty good overview. Okay. To, to, I want to definitely fire into Q&A here. Um, I know that we had some questions uh, for John about testing. There were some questions about calibration and stuff. Carson, do you want to? fire some questions towards the panel? Sure. Uh, so I'm Carson from treestuff.com back here running the webinar and I've been collecting, Jake and I have been collecting a bunch of questions. Let's hit the panel. Um, how are, well, we'll start with John and some testing related stuff. Um, how are the pull testing machines and the, the brake testing machines calibrated? We have a third party calibration uh, team that comes in. They're calibrated once a year and they're calibrated to the ASTME standard it's uh, ASTME 4 standard. But essentially what they do is they'll bring in their load cells and they'll attach it to our machines and we'll go through a series of different loads to see how accurate our load cell is reading compared to theirs. Um, what's really cool is the, the Satec tensile tester. It's, it's all under a metal compression when it's doing that. And you can actually see when it's loading up to that million pounds, you can actually see the metal and the, you can see their load cells compressing when we're when we're pushing against it. Um, another one, and this one comes from Nels Backstrom. Is there a test, um, I think this one popped up right around when we were looking at a lot of the abrasion testing. Um, is there a test where you add dirt or sap into the rope as part of the testing process? We've done a decent amount of testing when we, when, uh, where we add foreign materials. Um, I don't believe we've done very many specific to the arborist community, but when we're talking about dirt, we've done quite a few uh, tests for the mining industry where we'll, we'll add a lot of sediment and then we'll do like CBOS testing, which is cycling it over a shiv and see how much it degrades the line, but not a whole lot from arborist testing. We've also done a lot of chemical testing and uh, like one of our, oil, yeah, hydraulic oil. oil. One of our rec marine uh, customers sent in a request and asked if, if uh, beer and blood degraded the rope. So we actually did some testing to make sure that beer and blood did not Hard work. degrade the rope. Yeah. I'm going to steal this for just a second. Greg, Greg and I just had a little off, uh, off mic comment there. Um, I may be getting you into some trouble here, but I've heard over the years, uh, and I may have done it, um, but of people using diesel fuel to clean sap off of ropes. And um, I've had a lot of people over the years ask me how to clean sap off the ropes, and I'm like, I don't know because I just can't tell people. But I whispered that to you, and you just said that's fine. So uh, yeah, is, yeah, for the most part. using diesel fuel to clean the sap off of our climbing it, line. It's worth noting um, that how do I clean sap off of a climbing line was a question asked, and yeah, it has it's, also it's asked been asked all the time. Yeah. from everyone who's Absolutely. ever asked Absolutely. So I'll, give you, the, I'll so. give you the quick answer, and then I'll give you the more in-depth answer. 
My rule of thumb with generally most of these materials is if it's safe enough to get on your hands, it's probably good to go on the rope. So I can use diesel fuel. Like in I wouldn't moderation, I, in moderation. I to wouldn't clean, to, to scrub sap off yes, my rope. Yes, absolutely. It was, diesel fuel breaks the sap down. I mean, yeah, it gets absolutely. Rid of it. Yeah, look, I mean, most of these materials are. If you go into you go downstairs to our chem lab and you open up the, the cabinet, what are the chemicals stored in polyethylene bottles? Right. A yeah. Nalgene bottle is polyethylene. Your soda bottle is polyester. I mean, if it's safe on your hands, it's probably safe on the rope. That being said. If there is any question, if you're going, hey, man, I'm just not quite sure of this, call us up. We have a, 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 a host of application engineers and customer service people who answer these kind of questions all day. just ask for Greg. Yeah, shoot us an email, call us up. We have a directory of thousands of chemicals. What's your extension? Uh, gee, what is my extension? Uh, I don't know. Great, right, I don't call my own answer. number. Gmosguy at samsonrope.com. No, I don't, I, don't, I don't call my own number, but if you, if you go to our website, you can say, hey, let me talk to engineering. They'll redirect the question. Like I said, we have directories of thousands and thousands of tests on That's all of our fiber cool. materials. Uh, and if we haven't tested it and it's really important, we'll test it. I think this may be the most valuable question that we've ever answered on a webinar. I've been asked no less than a thousand times in my five years at Teresa uh, what the approved method of cleaning rope off. And I'm telling you, it's diesel fuel, baby. Uh, Carson. We Next have, question, please. We have a couple more um, that I'll kind of try to lump together because so it's all about tell people that how so different things affect the rope. Um, Joseph Mitchell wants to know if a dryer on low heat will damage the rope. Um, no, you shouldn't damage the rope. I mean, the one thing you're going to have to be aware of, particularly with nylons, is nylons are going to shrink. Um, so if you go through like a, a wet dry or heating and drying cycle, you can shrink a nylon rope. Now, a lot of our ropes are pre-shrunk, so we'll actually steam the nylon prior to it running into the core, for example, on static ropes. Um, but yeah, if you got your brand new nylon cord climbing line, uh, yeah, low heat should be fine. I mean, the worst case scenario, it shrinks up a little bit. You start using it, it's going to stretch back out. I mean, just like a pair of jeans. Exactly. Um, how does sunlight affect a rope? Paul Durham says he's noticed that the rope swing rope, swing rope is faded. Is yes, it also so there, there, is, there, is the, there is the never ending issue of UV degradation. Uh, that is going to affect all polymeric materials. So polymeric materials being plastic. So all of our fibers are to some degree or another affected by UV. Now that doesn't mean you leave it out for a day, it's gone. But uh, there's no amount of protection you can put on it that it won't eventually get degraded. Absolutely. Is there a hard stop? Uh, you know, Cleveland, Ohio, 300 days of shadiness, at, you know, of gray skies. Um, I've got a rope that's been outside for two years. Is that still good? Uh, yeah, it probably should be. Basically, what, what you'll see is if you're, if you're using the rope actively and it's also being UV damaged, generally what you'll see is that UV damage will manifest itself through more abrasion of the rope. So the, it's the fibers on the outside that are getting kind of embrittled. Those will also be the fibers that start breaking and fuzzing up. So, you know, it, it really, they're kind of coupled together. I mean, the one place you'd really run a risk is if you sat there and said, hey, I left this rope outside for 10 years and I haven't touched it in 10 years, and now I'm going to load it up to half of its breaking strength. Yeah, you might be in trouble. So when, when is, is enough enough? Because, um, I mean, I know a lot of people have swings and a lot of arborists have set rope swings in their backyards and stuff like that. You know, two years is good, three years is good. When is enough enough? How do you know um, if it, you know, like, obviously, we're, you know, you don't see severed strands. Uh, is, th you know, is it five years? I mean, to me, there's got to be a point where you're just like, it's been too long. It's, it's worth noting that that question in a couple different forms did pop up tw two or three times yeah. in these comments. Just uh, if, there, if there's not some clear sign of damage, is there a time limit on a rope? Is there some point where I should stop using it? Yeah, like if I store Acro it in my Acro closet across a cool, dry environment. If you, if you store years. it in your closet for a cool, dry environment for 10 years, not a problem. If you left it out in the hot sun for 10 years and it's a small diameter rope, I would replace it. Um, it's hard to say exactly when. It really matters on what you're doing with it and where it is and the size of the rope. So okay. it's really hard to say. If you're swinging super on it, clear. If you're swinging on it, it probably is good longer than if your kids are swinging on it. Uh, yeah. But make smart decisions. Yeah. Um, but I think what Greg has solidified for us is that it's not dental floss. Um, yeah. And as long as you're reasonable with it, yeah. uh, and it's a Samson product, yeah. um, it's going to last damn near forever. Yeah. I love it. Uh, 
another we are dispelling myths. <laughs> we are debunking shit. Mythbusters with another with Greg. similar question um, along the same lines. How does storage affect the life of a rope? That comes from Michael Trainer. So again, if you're if you're going to be storing the rope, I mean, we recommend in the dark in a cool, dry place like anything else, right? That's going to really maximize your odds of not having any issues. I mean, it's impossible to sit there and say I'm going to cover every possible base, but I mean. You know, you want to keep it out of the sun because no matter no matter how much uh, protection we put into the fiber and into the coatings, nothing's perfect. And just like no matter how much su SPF sunscreen you put on, you're eventually going to get a sunburn. And can I put sunscreen on my rope? Because it's uh, safe on my hands. <laughs> you could. It might be a little greasy. Um, and then, you know, in terms of keeping it dry, that's really much more of a of going to be like a aesthetic and kind of human health and safety. You don't want to be growing mold on your rope and mildew on your rope. It's it, It's just going to be nasty for that. So, you know. Cool and dry should should last a really long time. Definitely get that musky, mildewy smell. And my climbing line, like, I mean, no, not, no joke, right? I mean, you put it away in the truck wet and you go get it the next day. And it, I mean, you can smell mildew. You can smell like there being some kind of bacterial, moldy, yeah. like fung fungal growth in there. Yeah, and I mean, talking about talking about washing stuff, you know, if you did want to wash a rope, I mean, we would recommend you use a really mild, either use no detergent or use something like a woolite. Don't go with a heavy-duty closed detergent because that's actually stuff you don't want to put on your hands. You put a real heavy-duty detergent hot on your hands, you're going to that, – that's a caustic substance. Yeah, more so, so I, than diesel or even – More so than diesel, absolutely. That's a, that's a strong, caustic, strong base. So you do, if you did get something on your rope and you say, I absolutely want to clean this, I'd recommend getting something like Woolite putting the rope into a bag, the kind of bag you know, you, you're going to put like your pantyhose in, like a mesh bag, yeah. and you put it in on a cold cycle with your Woolite. Dumping on a cool dry, your rope will be just fine. I mean, polyester is polyester, same as your leisure suit, right? Eventually, or your yeah. Eventually, eventually, you wash it too many times, it will wear out. But I mean, you know, take it easy and use use mild stuff if you can. Very cool. Next question, Gar. People are really taking advantage of having rope experts here. Uh, Stephen Collins wants to know how freezing affects the breaking strength of a rope. Uh, it don't matter. So I, <laughs> I want to expand on that question because yeah. I'm actually now I'm intrigued. Yeah. Um, I completely saturate my rope and then I freeze it. There's no expansion. We're not like pushing the, the particles of the rope out. No. So in fact, what you're going to get on a micro level, the, the polymers, the plastics actually get stronger, the colder they get. Nice. So all these polymers we're talking about with the exception of the aramids are actually above what you call our glass transition temperature. So this you know, we all, we chemistry all know stuff. what glass transition temperature is. So, you don't need to talk so about like that. Yeah, so, <laughs> I mean, it, if you're cooling the rope down, you're, in fact, actually making it slightly stronger. Don't go now double your loads on things. But, I mean, no, look, we, you know, some of these ropes we sell, we're, they're going up into the Arctic. I mean, we, we're, we got, you know, a big part of our business is, you know, uh, mooring lines for oil tankers. These things run up and down in Alaska all day long up on the North Slope. You want a rope that's covered in ice? I mean, take a look at an oil tanker up on the North Slope. It's not a problem. So okay, <laughs> while we're debunking myths, Sharpie. Yeah. Is there any amount of Sharpie that I can put on my rope that's going to hurt it? No. Yes! If, as long as, if you've got a Samson rope, yeah. you can mark it with Sharpie, mark the middle. You can do whatever you want. It's we, totally fine. We actually use Sharpies to do pretty much all of our splicing as well and almost all of our marking and on ropes. And it's totally fine to put a Sharpie on the inside of a Samson rope. I can pull the core out, mark it up, write my name on it, put it back in there, climb on it. Not a problem. Samson rope, Sharpie proof. Boom, debunking myths. How does rope being wet affect its breaking strength? Good question. Um, for almost all ropes, it doesn't matter. For nylon, it does. So nylon's a special case. So nylon, actually, like I said, it shrinks. Uh, at the same time, it also uh, weakens slightly. So you get a soaking wet nylon rope, it's going to be like 10 to 15% weaker than it would be when it's dry. That's really interesting. You know, we were talking earlier, um, all the things that devalue rope, right? Like, as soon as you touch the rope, it's not brand new, right? As soon as you uncoil it, you bend it, uh, it's weaker. You put a knot in it, a splice in it. Everything we do, every, like, way that we interact with rope makes it a little bit weaker. It, yeah. deval it degrades that breaking strength. And that's why, you know, I'm a 165-pound guy. That's why I don't have a 250-pound breaking strength rope because – we count on those. We count on that. We count on a little bit of sunlight. We count on it being allowed to be wet, allowed to have a knot in it, and all those things that are pulling 10% and 20% here and there, they all add up. Absolutely. And then I fall yeah. and apply a peak force, 
and the rope still needs to be strong. And that's why we have standards that require a 5,000 pound breaking strength for a 200 pound man. Absolutely. That's really, it's really cool. I love it. As we get into breaking strengths, um, Mark Ware asks a question that I think touches on a really, really important thing to clarify that I think a lot of people don't completely understand. Um, he says, is average rope strength, and I mean, we'll, what we normally hear is average breaking strength, yep. um, is that the same as the working load limit? Absolutely not. <laughs> okay, so here's how it works. When we publish on our website the average breaking strength of a rope, what that means is we've, when we develop a new product, we will break a whole bunch of ropes. So we're talking usually at a minimum, our minimum magic number here is 40. In some cases, we're going to break more. But we'll use 40 rope samples to create a population. Of and how many production runs? Is that like, it's, is it 40 samples off the same spool? Or do no, you have to no, pull those? No, you're going to pull them from multiple production runs. Often that's multiple sizes. There's a lot of tricks we do in terms of how we model things out. But at the end of the day, what you have is you have a, you have a, you have a distribution of break strength. So if I take the exact same piece of rope off the same production run and pull two pieces off it and then break two pieces, they're not going to break the same every time. You're always going to have a little bit of variation. Um, so what we do is we publish what's called our average breaking strength. So that's, that's literally what it is. That is the, the average of all of them. And therefore, it's the average of what we'd expect to see long term out of everything that comes out of the plant. Because we don't test every single thing we make. It's impossible. If I break tested every single thing I made, I wouldn't be able to sell everything because everything would be in the trash can. So, um, and then what we do is we have what's called our minimum break strength. So what we do is we end up playing a lot of statistical games and trying to understand where the limit is that I can expect almost everything to be above. Um, so what we say is that our MBS, our minimum break strength, is going to be the value above which more than 90% of everything we'll make in the future will be above. So you say, oh my god, 10% are, are weaker than minimum strength. Absolutely. But the majority of those guys that are 10% below are just barely below because it's this Gaussian distribution, this bell curve. And like you were saying, you got a safety factor. So if you're, if you're at, you know, a uh, 1% below minimum, you're still, you know, 5 or 4.99 above your working load limit, right? 4.99 times your working load limit. So that's, that's where your working load limit comes in. So your working load limit is basically what we're going to say is, how high am I willing to take this rope in this application? So to your point, if you got a 1,000-pound rope, or 1,000-pound average, or 1,000-pound minimum breaking strength rope, then your working load limits would, say, be 200 pounds. That's a 5 to 1 safety factor. Um, but you don't, but I think the important thing is, is that, like, tree stuff, and Samson don't say what a safety factor is. Because, like, for me, I could be like, you know what, I'm pulling a rock out of a ditch with a giant skitter with an enclosed cab, so maybe my safety factor is two to one, and I'm willing to put 5,000 pounds on this 10,000-pound rope because there's very low risk. Exactly. Right? But if I'm hoisting a human, then I'm going to put a 10 to one safety factor on or it. 20 to one or a 20 to yeah, one. Or a 20 to one. Right? Yeah. And if I'm rigging over a piece of property that I don't want to break, maybe a five to one, right? Because like, you know, I can always rebuild the soffit of a house if a rope were to have a catastrophic failure. Um, so I think the important thing is, is that minimum and average breaking strengths are technical they resources. Just, they, they describe the product itself, right. not the usage. And that's what's supplied by manufacturers and by retailers. But then safe working load is more of a how you as the user are applying that product. So it's up to you as the user to determine a safe working load. Or there are standards. In some cases, there are standards. There are standards, but, you know, and I'm going to tell you, 5 to 1, you know, for rigging at a, ver at a minimum and 10 to 1 for human life Absolutely. as a minimum is what I would recommend, like, to a friend of mine that was asking, like, how should I be determined safe working loads for my lifting and rigging operations? So I think that's the easy way to answer that, but there's, it's really hard. I, I think it's well said. I mean, you're looking at a couple things. You're looking at... That, that safety factor or that amount you're derating, you're looking at what you said, consequence. What happens if it does go wrong? If it's a low risk, then you, may, you might be willing to push it more. If it's a high risk, no. You also want to know how, how well do I know what my actual load is? You know, you might have weighed the thing and you know the thing I'm lifting weighs exactly 1,000 pounds. Or you might have gone, yeah, it's about 1,000 pounds. So if you're not sure, again, you want to be able to give yourself more cushion. The other thing safety factor gives you, it lets you wear things out. Right? It lets you lose strength and still be good enough. Exactly. And the last thing to think about 
is in fact, if you are running something at a lower safety factor, so at a higher working load, you're generally wearing it out quicker, right? So think about you know an economy car versus a top fuel dragster. The top fuel dragster can get 3,000 horsepower. You know what? It gets it for all about five seconds, and then they got to rebuild the engine, right? So the lower, the less you're working your rope, you're going to get longer life out of it. So in some cases, you know, you you go, I'm going to use this thing once, and then I'm done. I'm throwing it in the trash. Yeah, you might be willing to push it a bit more. If you're sitting there going, you know, what? I want 10 years of service out of this thing. Take it easy. Don't go around flooring it, right? I think that this is a good time. I want to give you an opportunity to show the wheel. Yeah, and okay. I think this is a great segue to it. All right. Let's have you show the wheel. Um, Gavin can hold the mic for you. Okay. Um, while you talk Where's the about camera? the wheel. Yeah, let me you can do this. I'll frame the shot. All right. And, and, um, and we'll continue to get some questions. So bring, bring it up for me. So this is something we came up with, uh, a, what, a year and a half ago? A year ago, yeah. maybe? Something about really that? Tight on it, Greg, so okay. I will try not to move it. So this is something we came up with. This is our, uh, our calculator, uh, old-fashioned analog calculator for helping arborists uh, do rigging, and particularly in kind of dynamic drop applications. So when you're topping a tree, for example. And so it's a, it's a nice little two-sided hard plastic device so you can throw it down the mud and in and, and the dirt and get wet and it'll continue to work. So what we have on side number one is we've got a way to estimate your log mass. So, you know, when you were getting trained as an arborist, you probably learned some rules of thumb. You've probably seen some tables. Um, basically, this, this is the same information that you find in a lot of those tables is now put into a calculator. So what I can do is all i got to look at is see what's the diameter of my log in inches on this scale here and what's the length of it in feet. And I line those two guys up. So say I've got a 10-inch diameter, 10-foot long piece. I can come down to this table and say, OK, what species am I working with? Okay, I'm working with, say, uh, you know, a green ash. That's going to be 47 uh, uh, pounds per cubic foot. So on the outside, or up here on this density thing, I can find 47 and look up to my weight and I can go, that's a 250 pound piece of wood. So it's letting you estimate rather rapidly, reliably, what's the mass of the piece you're dropping. Then once you know that, or if you already knew that, you come to the backside and this is where it gets important. Um, as you guys probably know, if you're dropping something, dropping a log, and you're catching it with a rope, the, the shock load or the amount of load that the peak maximum instantaneous load on the line is going to far exceed the, the weight of the object itself. Um, and how much higher that peak load is depends on a lot of factors. It depends on the type of rope you're using. So as I said, nylon, stretchy, and polyester, for example. So the nylon's going to lower that peak load because it's going to allow it to stretch more. Um, what the size of the rope is. A stronger rope is also going to stretch less under the same load conditions. So you can actually have a stronger rope. We'll see a higher peak load. Um, it'll be less as a percentage of its brake strength. But oftentimes, you're not necessarily worried about breaking the rope. You're also worried about the hardware or where the hardware is mounted to the, like, you don't, you don't want to snap the bow off the, the tree that you're tied off onto. So what we do here, and you also care about how much rope is in the system. So, if we look at this little diagram here, we have two lengths. We have length one and length two. Length one is going to be basically the, the center of mass of the piece you're topping uh, from there to where your upper block is. And then length two is going to be the remaining amount of line in the system from the, the blocking point down to where you've tied it off. So it's three and 24. Okay. So let's say we've got, you know, three feet in here and 24 feet in there. You're going to have, a, 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 it's not quite the same as a fall factor in rock climbing, but it's, pretty, it's doing the same thing. What we've got is we've got 24 over 3, so our L2 over L1 is going to be an 8. So you've got an 8 to 1 factor. So if we come up here and we said our, earlier, we said our mass of our log was uh, uh, 250 pounds, right? So if I come up here to my 250 pound and I got my 8 to 1 fall factor right there, now I can look down here. And I can, this will tell me, in my worst case scenario, what's my peak load going to be in the system when that log drops off for all these different sizes of Nystron and all those different sizes of stable braid. So this is going to give you an idea of just how safe your drop is. If you're in the green, you're below a 5 to 1 safety factor working load. So you're completely cool. If you're up in the yellow zone, you're above that 5 to 1 working load limit, but you're well below brake strength. And it's not until you get up into the red that you're approaching the brake strength of the line. You definitely don't want to be there. Um, that being said, this 
is telling you for the worst case scenario. Um, generally, the loads will be lower. This is if you've tied off on that lower anchor. You know, anytime I look at this and I say, I'm in the yellow, I'm not going to tie it off. I'm going to let that line run. So when I've topped it, it drops. It's going to start sliding. That's already going to lower your peak loads. So again, this, if you actually went and put this in the field and tested it and you hooked up a dynamometer, most of your drops might be lower than what this calculates. But this is really doing the worst case scenario, keeping it safe. Gavin, uh, you'll have to restate this because they can't hear me. Oh. Gavin, tell, tell us a little bit about the reasoning behind this product. Obviously, you guys are going to make no money uh, in any kind of scale selling these things. They're, they're not expensive. Um, even if you sold one to every arborist, it probably doesn't pay for the time that went into it. It looks really complex. Tell us about why Samson put the effort into this. Yeah, basically this was a value add. I mean, considering that we have experts in the field, not only in, in arborist applications, but in engineering itself, this is something we felt would be beneficial to the market in general. So we spent a lot of time making sure this was easy to execute, easy to print, and then, as Greg mentioned, easy to carry around. You can throw it in your bag, you can throw it in the bottom of your truck, and it's just going to stay durable. We just wanted to make sure you guys had the best possible information to make sure you get your job done. Yeah, job done safely. So, you know, it's all, you know, it's all about being safe. You know, we developed this in the lab. We did a bunch of testing in the lab. Then we took it out in the field and dropped a bunch of logs. I mean, we, we, we took down, like I think, like four trees over the course of a week, topping it section by section by section, instrumenting the heck out of the whole thing, videotaping the whole thing. And what we found is, you know, every single time we were, you know, the worst case, we never got to the worst case. So, you know, confident you're safe. So, but again, you still got to use your judgment. You still got to use your training. This just lets you do an extra level of checking, an extra level of safety to make sure you're using things properly. And it also gives you some insight into, you know, how the differences in performance of different ropes actually affect the overall system of what, what's happening. We're going uh, to bring these into stock at Tree Stuff. Um, and, uh, you know, if you send an email and you reference this uh, within the next couple days uh, to media at treestuff.com with your address, uh, maybe we'll send you one. So uh, I saw a bunch of people saying they really wanted these. So uh, I think we'll get an order in and maybe we'll give uh, some of the lucky people that are watching this webinar live tonight uh, a little thank you for watching. Uh, so those will come to you uh, from Tree Stuff. If you just send an email to media at treestuff.com uh, claiming your free Samson log impact force calculator wheel of amazingness. <laughs> um, what other questions do we have? Let's sit back down, gentlemen. Yep. All right, I'm going to give you this real quick and make sure we're framed. I do have a couple more. Um, Along the same lines, somebody, uh, Brad Boer asks, does salt water do damage to rope fibers? Um, no. Well, so nylon, as I said, water, water gets into nylon. So nylon is like a bit of a water sponge on a molecular level. It sucks the water up. Um, the fact that it's salt water is not going to cause a difference. So again, I think three quarters of our applications are maritime of some degree or another. I mean, it's fishing, uh, you know, uh, tugboats, mooring you know, river, tug, or river barge transport, uh, deep water oil exploration. I mean, our ropes are primarily living in salt water. And no, salt water is nothing special. Uh, Jason Dudick, who we know. Hi, Jason. What's up? Good to Hi, see you. Um, he has been to a bunch of our splicing courses. He's, he's very into splicing. He wants to know who comes up with the splicing instructions for Samson Rope. A lot of our splicing instructions have been around for, for 20, 30 years, but we're always uh, creating new lines, uh, creating new constructions. So it comes down to um, a group of the lab technicians as well as our actual fabrication team and then a bit of engineering support as well on coming up and they just pretty much say, hey, we got this new rope or we got this new application, how should we splice it? Or we need this splice that's half the length of our current splices and we just sit around and we brainstorm coming up with those new splices. Test, test, test. Yep. And then we test to make sure that it's not slipping out and that it's meeting the actual specs that we have set for that line. I, I just want to make an important point about splicing. I, we get a lot of questions. People go, hey, I, I got a different way to splice my rope, or I got a better way to splice my rope. Absolutely. Um, we're by no means saying our particular splice method is the only way or the best way. Not at all. What we're saying is that our specifications that we put on our website and that we're guaranteeing when we ship you the product is, is uh, specified per our instructions. In fact, you might have a splice that actually makes the brake strength higher. That could happen. But again, like I said, we have thousands of products uh, that we have to test on an ongoing basis for quality control. 
if I was to start testing everybody's individual splice designs, in addition to having to test all those products, the amount of testing we have to do would go through the roof. So you won't update your splicing instructions to include my 30 second time? Uh, no. Okay. Wow. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so, and there, so Don't that, bother. Yeah, there's better ways to do it, perhaps, absolutely, but we've, the, the, way, we, the way we've set it up is kind, of, is kind of a happy medium for good performance, easy to teach and learn, and reasonably easy to do in, in, in time. I mean, John here's a whiz. I mean, he can do all kinds of crazy splices that don't that don't fall under the instructions. Um, but there are a lot. He's got years and years of experience doing it, right? Uh, and we try to set up the instructions that we put up in a way so that uh, a new guy can watch the video and be able to reproduce it without seven years of splicing experience. I have a question. Uh, I good, good. Uh, our email is blowing up for the wheel. Um, please don't post that. Or we only have so many things, so um, that's, that's kind of uh, Hang on, hang on. we got to. Sorry, folks. We've got some. Carson's telling me my audio is down. I'm try and see what's, what's going on with it. Uh, if, can they hear me? Because I'll just keep going. Um, so I, I try to answer a lot of questions for people. I take a lot of the more advanced technical questions um, at Tree Stuff, and uh, people often ask me about splicing and they find themselves actually in the same thing where you said that we can't we can't test everything we make yeah. so oftentimes a guy will do his first splice and not use it and they'll do a second splice and feel a little better about it and maybe not use it and you know just cut it off and redo it but eventually they get to the point where you know they want to use the splice and Stop waving it. and they don't <laughs> and they don't know um, they don't know if it's good and I you know I can't give people the official word all the time. I can't say, yeah, that splice looks good to me. Um, but I try to be really pragmatic. And uh, one of the things that I tell people, uh, and I'm hoping that I've been right all this time, yeah. is that the splicing instructions are meant um, and are designed to allow a little leeway um, and that that's why the berries are as long as they are. Um, and I try to tell people splicing is not magic. It's not abracadabra. It is science. Um, and that if you follow the instructions, don't cut out any steps, and you're able to close it, yep. it's good to go. Um, and I think that is true. Is that true? Like, if, So if I follow all the instructions and that sucker closes, it's a good splice. Absolutely. And I think you make a good point about things like tail lengths. You're right. They are deliberately left a little long. Because there's really two things that can happen if you, if you do the splice wrong. Um, the one thing that might happen is it might break a little, the brake strength might be a little bit lower than the spec. But again, like we're saying, we've got a working load limit. So again, if I'm lifting 200 pounds and instead of my rope being 1,000 pounds, it's only 980 pounds, you're still fine. Right. So you're, you're allowed to have a little bit of leeway. That's why we have safety factors. Uh, the other thing would be, you know, did it slip out entirely? Is that, is that, that would be a catastrophic kind of thing. That's where your point about, yeah, we leave those tails a little bit long. We a lot of times people go, well, I, I, I do my tail shorter. I did it with a three-inch berry. <laughs> fine. You know what? It might have, but, uh, you know, do it every time and, you know, you, because right. yeah. if you come up short on that, yeah. um, then, then you're basically SOL. So uh, another myth, another question answered, if you're splicing a Samson rope and you follow all the instructions and it closes, you're good to go. Yeah, and our, and our specs, uh, like we say on the catalog, our specs are as spliced. So if the rope is spliceable and we have a splice instruction available for you on the, online, then that minimum breaking strength is of the spliced rope, which is not something you can say for every manufacturer out there. A lot of times, if you look at, for example, uh, European standards with ISO test, what that says is, oh, the rope breaks at 900 pounds? Well, the splice causes a strength loss of 10%, so it's a 1,000-pound rope. That's the rule. A uh, little bit disingenuous, if you ask me. Yeah, maybe so. Uh, Carson, what other questions do we have? Yeah, I know, um, I think Gavin had some closing remarks, so I'm going to toss hopefully an easy one over to Gavin, and uh, we can close with that. Um, Elliot Thompson wants to know where they can buy some of that sweet Samson swag. Wow, that's a tough one. I think the best thing to do there is um, uh, go to your Tree Stuff location, um, get online, come to see us at some of the shows that are coming out, and we may or may ha not have some. I would try to impress Gavin with your social media prowess and support of Samson. That's probably the best way to get Samson swag is to be like tagging Samson every day, like making them look good. That's, uh, actually, that's actually correct. Gavin says that's the way. So the only way is to become like a, a Samson advocate. So do it to it. 
All right, so yeah, so I wanted to close off the session with a few of the uh, uh, rapid fire questions. So this is for you guys real quick. All right, so question. These are on the quiz. These are on the quiz. So I want to make sure everybody has them. Question number one, what are the three fundamental steps in making a braided rope? Twisting, winding, and braiding. Great. Which of the following factors affect the peak load on a line during a dynamic drop? I already explained that, didn't I? I <laughs> sure hope so. <laughs> no, what's going to matter is, is, is the type of rope you got, how much rope you got in the system, how heavy your thing is that you're dropping, Whoa. and the fall factor. And how it's connected. How is, well, no, no the, how, how it's connected. Well, well, yeah, connected. It, it, it all depends if you're letting it run or, or no, not. That, is it wrapped around a baller? That's going to affect how strong the, the system is, but the peak load is going to be dictated by how much the whole thing stretches. So not quite. I, I mean, don't know, though. A figure eight you, knot might have a more of a dynamic response than a splice because there's tightening in the knot. Yeah, OK, I'll give you uh, that. All right, well done. <laughs> What types of rope have a parallel core construction? A Kern mantle rope. Uh, how many centers does Arbor Master have? It's got eight centers. Well done. Uh, Arbor Master and Mercury ropes have two distinctly different manufacturing processes. The center is twisted. The twinner for Arbor Master is twisted, and the cover is braided. Where is the wax finish applied in the Arbor Master process? Uh, at twisting of the first twist of the cover. Yeah, that was shown in the video at the plant tour, but we were kind of rushing through that. The answer is not on the outside. How many strands are in an Arbor Master cover? Oh, that would be 16. You are right. Uh, most climbing lines in our Arbor Master are made of these materials, nylon and polyester. Normally, a rope break strength is based on what type of rope? It is on a spliced rope. Uh, where are the most common places that ropes break during a brake test? I'm, I'm not sure if we went over this during the actual lab tour, but it's typically at the base of splice. And what happens at the base of splice is throughout the entire splice, you have a slight reduction in the actual uh, the strength of the line in that area where, where your braid is a little bit tighter and you get some reduced strength. But what makes up for it is you actually have more volume of fibers throughout that splice area. Right at the base of the splice, you still have a little bit of distortion of those outer strands, but you have no additional fiber to make up for that. So it creates a small little weak point right at the base of the splice, and that's typically where you get a lot of the breaks and during so, testing. And so, John, that's why you'd say that, you know, if you want to make sure your, your splicing is as good as possible, where, where you would spend the extra 30 seconds in a splice is in making a real nice taper at the tip. Yep. The nicer you can transition from having that bulk in the middle to having nothing, if you can smooth that out, really make that taper real gradual, that's going to maximize your strength there. Yeah, it's and, typically and all about the great, taper. Great testing your splices and you're seeing breaks in the eye um, or anywhere other than at that position, you're probably doing something wrong. Yeah, that typically means that you got some kind of really weak point somewhere in the eye. Because if you think about it, once the eye breaks off and goes around that pin, you essentially have two legs there. If uh, one of those legs are breaking, you got pretty much less than 50% of your brake strength well, weakened on eye, that part. Uh, having the eye be too tight. Um, yeah, so there's, I mean, yeah. It's particularly with double braid, double, like class one double braid splicing, it's, you know, if the first time you're trying it, a lot of times it can be a little tricky how you're matching those two legs, because you bring the two legs up and kind of run them the opposite directions and through. That's kind of the trickiest part. But, yeah. Yeah. yeah, good job. But I mean, yeah, if you could, if you can master a, a class one double braid, I mean, everything else is kind of easy. We have a great splicing series. It's $50 or something cheap like that. The Nick Araya splicing series where we show uh, full, like full run throughs of all the splices with Nick and he talks you yeah. through it. And then afterwards, uh, we bring in the big guns, Eric Vega, the quality and control manager for Rope Logic, mm -hmm. and we have a full uninterrupted top down splice. And I mean, he's knocking out double braids at five minutes or less. Um, and it's continuous from a static camera, and it's really fun to watch. And um, people really enjoy the series. You watch it online on the Tree Stuff website. You buy it once, you own it forever. So it's a really cool resource. If you don't have it, I uh, recommend getting it. If you own the Nick Araya Splicing Series and like it, give me a heart. If you don't like it, give me a thumbs down, or one of the angry signs. All right, almost done here. Um, after excessive wear, ropes see both internal and external abrasion. Uh, the main cause of internal abrasion is from fiber sliding, rubbing against itself. The answer is true. What standards do we use when performing uh, our drop tower tests? That would be the EN 1891, I believe. Typically, how many samples do we break before we set break strengths? Sorry. 40? <laughs> yeah, yeah, 40, yeah. 
magic number and statistics. What factors are needed to calculate a weight on a log? Um, you, need, you need to know the size of the log, so diameter and the length, and the species is going to tell you the density of the material. Knots are generally stronger than splices. False. Wrong. Yeah, depending on the knot you're tying, you can lose anywhere from like 20 to 50% of the strength of the rope. Depends on the rope, depends on the knot, but knots are never the strongest way to do it. True or false, during a dynamic drop, the peak load of the line sees, the line sees is never great, greater than the mass of the object. The answer is false. Uh, three more, the tension of a rigging, on a rigging line may exceed the weight of the object suspended. You saw that in the drop test. I mean, you got, when John was doing those drop tests, you're dropping a 200-pound load, and yet the peak line force is up over 1,000 pounds. Right, John? Is that what you're Well doing? over 1,000 yeah. pounds. Depends on the scenario, but yeah. In a current mantle rope, the load is carried by the core, and in a double-rated rope, the load is carried by 50% the cover and the core. And that's all I got. Actually, probably one last thing I'd say. Um, when you do see us out and about in the field at shows, whatnot, please come talk to us. We love hearing what you guys think about our rope. We love getting new ideas. Uh, we want to you know, make the best rope we can so you get, to get your job done uh, safely uh, and quickly. And um, yeah, we're really glad that the Tree Stuff guys came out today. Thanks a lot. Uh, thank you, Gavin. I'd like to point out to everyone uh, watching that uh, I pitched the idea of doing this factory tour to every hardware and rope manufacturer in the Arbor's business. Uh, Samson were the people that saw the vision in it, uh, saw the importance to the value of to you guys as the customers. Um, they're the ones that made it happen. They put the work into it. They exposed, I mean, essentially the leadership, right, of the team. I mean, I know he doesn't look the part, but Greg's the head of the whole R&D for the whole company. Um, they had these people here for us. They had production shut down. Um, people were getting out of our way in the warehouse. Uh, a ton of effort, a ton of planning went into this thing. You know, we flew... 3,000 miles to come out here, um, and it's because Samson really wanted to do this with us. Uh, I'm hoping that some other manufacturers follow suit. Maybe I'd love to do like a carabiner thing or um, one of the hardware companies, but uh, I, I can't tell you guys how much I appreciate you being willing to do this for us and seeing the value in it. Uh, I think that the uh, audience really enjoyed this one, um, and I really hope people watch this uh, later online. Uh, as always, uh, I like to open and start with thanking the crew. Uh, Carson, Kale, Jake, uh, without those guys, this stuff just would never, ever happen. Um, it, we've taught ourselves a lot about the webinars over the last year and a half, and I think the production value has really gone up. Um, we were talking about that today, actually, as well, and uh, I think we owe a lot to our audience. So thank you guys for sticking with us as we've gone through various technical challenges uh, that we still have today. Um, but we love doing these things. Yeah, and, and, and you know, if there's any questions we didn't answer, um, if people go to samsonrope.com, there's a link in there. Ask a question. Uh, you can email us a question. Uh, we'll get back to you. I mean, that's what we're here for. Yep. Yep. Um, you know, hopefully within a day or two, we'll come back to you with a real good answer. Um, it can be a simple thing. It can be a highly technical thing. Uh, if we can't answer it, we'll tell you we can't answer, but most likely we can find you an answer. A couple fun opportunities. Uh, we've got Greg's face test. Uh, the most fun uh, that I can show my grandmother interpretation of uh, Greg's face test uh, sometime in the next couple of days. Work safe, uh, <laughs> please. Um, uh, we'll win a free Samson rope of your choice, anything that we sell on Samson. Um, and if you send an email in mentioning the, the wheel of weight, uh, we'll get you sorted out with one of those. If you're watching this webinar, look at the date on your watch or your cell phone because if you send an email to media in three months from today asking for one of these things, you're not getting nothing, I promise you. Um, so please don't email me a year after this video was published and ask for something for free. Not going to happen. Um, do thank you for watching. Uh, please check out all these Samson products. They're all available on treestuff.com. 7% off every day with the coupon code online. Uh, and please visit fallenfamiliesfund.org. Uh, you can find out uh, more information about a charity that we've set up over the last couple of years to provide direct financial assistance to individuals and families uh, that are affected by the loss of an earner due to their association or work in tree care. So that's a long way of saying that we provide short-term cash infusements to the people that um, are in a bad spot. So if you or someone you know has been injured or lost your ability to earn, there's an application there for you. Um, you can fill that out, and we can do our best uh, to try and help you out and stuff like that. So fallenfamiliesfund.org, 100% uh, of all funds raised through that website or any of our fundraising efforts go directly to uh, cash grants or towards 
uh, us forming an endowment uh, for the organization. None of the administrative costs, uh, none of my time or any of the other people that work on those committees time uh, is paid for or uh, in any way comes out of the funds that we've raised. So 100% of every dollar, not 99, 100% goes directly to an arborist or their family uh, that needs it. So really worthwhile thing. Uh, please do think about giving uh, and check it out. Thank you to Samson. Thank you to the crew. Thank you to our audience. Uh, you, can you do Danger Zone for me? Come on. <laughs> you were doing it so good before. Close us with a song. Dun, 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 dun. Revving up your engines, listen to the howl and roar. No, 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 no. Begging you to touch and go. All right, thanks a lot. <laughs> thanks, everybody.